Hello everyone and welcome to the webinar, Beyond the Headlines, a decision-making rubric for the next phase of online program growth. Um, this is presented in collaboration with Pearson and we're excited to be bringing this webinar to you today. We have some fantastic speakers here with us. We have Deb Gerhardt from Ohio University, Karen Kennedy from the University of Alabama, Birmingham, and Michelle Tufford from Pearson Embanet. And I believe that Michelle will be the first speaker to kick things off today. So I'm going to turn things over to Michelle. Thanks very much, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Um, what I'd like to talk with you today to kick off our webinar is just give a market overview of some of the key trends that we see happening in the marketplace today. You know, many of us know EduVentures estimated that the number of online students passed 2.5 million in 2010. Online higher education blossomed into a $25 billion industry with a double-digit growth year over year of online students over the previous 10 years began to slow down in 2012. And it's projected to continue to slow to a low of 2% growth annually over the next five years. At the same time, we're seeing a rapid growth in competition with many new institutions entering the marketplace. And many of the largest degree producing programs overall face a very difficult competitive environment. And I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this in the next slide. Um, so I'll move to the third point, which is you have some winners and some losers in terms of programs in the market today. Degree categories that have suffered the most from increases in competition and changes in the marketplace where the job prospects are a lot softer include uh, Master's in Business Administration degrees, Master's of Education degrees, RN to MSN programs, and Executive Any Type program for the most part. And at the bachelor's level, we see a slowdown in programs like RN to BSN and Bachelor's in Leadership, Multidisciplinary or Interdisciplinary degree completion programs. So there's a lot of significant competition that have affected those programs disproportionately. Now we still believe that there's wide variation in the quality of online education with far too many online programs using traditional techniques that work best in the on-ground classroom, like lecture capture or voiceover PowerPoint presentations for classes. And this isn't using the medium to its best advantage. We know a lot about how people learn and we should be applying the knowledge in our course design and development. This also applies to creating an intentional experience for the student in recruiting and supporting them throughout their program, making sure that application process is easy, that relevant communication on important matters and providing support and guidance to help the students stay and finish their degrees are really important aspects to improving the student experience. Most importantly, the student market will go to these programs that meet their critical need, which is improving their professional livelihood. You know, students really want tangible evidence of the types of success they can expect if they complete additional education. This includes training for new and different careers, promotions and raises in the occupations they currently have, or any type of benefit that they believe would be directly related to learning more in a degree program. Institutions that will focus on improving student outcomes and can demonstrate the benefits of their program to the student are likely to be the ones that survive the intense competition. And this is a pretty big task for most and a key challenge for the near future. Now I'd like to go back to talk a little bit about the second bullet on rapid growth in competition. This chart shows year-over-year -year growth in the number of master's degrees that were conferred from 2011 to 2014 in five leading degree categories. The MBA, the Master of Public Administration, the Master of Public Health, the Master of Social Work, and Master of Science in Nursing. You can see in the purple bars that four of these programs have experienced high growth in the number of degrees that have been conferred. The exception is the MBA. The bar shows only a 3% increase in conferrals from 2011 to 2014. And this actually hides the fact that there was actually a decline for the first time ever between 2012 and 2013 by about 4,000 degrees. 
The orange bars indicate the growth in the number of online programs over the same time in these fields. And we know this data because we've been collecting it for several years. The level of growth in competition should give any institution of higher education pause for thought as they consider their online strategy. The ability to adequately market an online program to its intended audience is only going to become more expensive. Understanding how to create a competitive advantage in marketing is key to the next stage of growth for many institutions. And this will definitely require significant capital investments in building awareness, interest, and the reputation of online programs. And with that short market overview, I'll pass this on to Deb Gerhardt. Hello, everybody. I was, I'm so happy to be here this afternoon. I wanted to give you a quick little overview of Ohio University. And um, it was founded in 1804. And the picture you can see on the slide is Cutler Hall. That building was built in 1816, and it's currently where I have my office. We are a multi-campus institution with five regional campuses serving around Southeast Ohio. And you can see our students and our full-time faculty there. With uh, our eLearning Ohio program and our regional higher education, we have, uh, the, we have about you know, close to 40% of our students are um, adult learners who we've reached access that way. So the vision of Ohio University is to be the best transformative learning community. And part of where eLearning Ohio fits into that is, um, we're, we're, as I said, with the regional higher education, we're the educational access um, arm of the university for that. Um, I have been doing um, distance and online education. I just started in my 29th year. And um, one of the programs I knew about long before I came to Ohio was, uh, as I worked in print courses or correspondence at that time, um, the outreach here at Ohio started um, in 1974 with a strong print program in correctional education. So we have four associate degrees and one bachelor's degree that's still all delivered in print with our primary audience being incarcerated students. So we have a strong history there and have moved on with eLearning Ohio that, you know, it's part, or we have correctional education as part of that, but our eLearning Ohio has now become the unit that is working with truly online programs. And Ohio has, uh, is a large decentralized institution, and so there has been some challenges there. Right now we offer seven um, bachelor degree completion programs. The primary audience for that is with um, our community college partners. Um, the, the strategic partnership side of my title is that I work with our community college partners, and many of them are place-bound, and so these degree completion programs have been geared up to help these students who are place bound can complete their bachelors. We also work um, with a number of master's programs. We have eight master's programs that are with Pearson, at Pearson and Bennett. Um, we also are working now directly with um, programs with the campus here in Athens, um, graduate programs, and that's growing. And we support some of the college-run programs. As I said, it's a very decentralized um, model here. And I'll be explaining a little bit more about that as we go along. So we have our first poll question. And you were given the instructions about how to go up to the block and answer the question. How do you determine what is the right online market pro, uh, for program expansion at your institution? That will give us a little start on where we're looking at today. And I think you need to click on the little A box. And from what I'm seeing under the little box, there's uh, Quite a few say A. Um, there, it's coming up on the screen. Um, a lot of people are saying none, which um, is part of what that I have thought that you know people look at um, you know di at different things. 
Okay, we'll give that just another second and then we'll move on. Okay, it seems like 66% uh, do say none for what they're looking at for the market. So we're going to move on from the poll question now to the next slide. Okay, so I'm going to be taking I'm going to be taking kind of the overview of an administrator and, and a large picture overview. Um, Karen, our other speaker, will talk things more down in the trenches. But when you want to take a program online, where do you start? Um, and, you know, and what you're looking at is a lot of times are they top-down decisions from the administration, oftentimes even higher from that, even sometimes board of trustees um, look at things as like let's move into this world. Are you looking at the bottom up, the, those that are driven by faculty and they see a need and want to move forward? So uh, there's really a strong mixture of the two of those. And I'll be discussing that a little more in detail as I get into the next section, but that's primarily what we're going to be looking at. So you want to take the program online and how, and how is this starting first? Who should be involved in the planning? That's another really key question. Um, it, uh, you know, most of the time that, you know, with the faculty group starting the curriculum process and getting through all the approvals, but one of the things is that there is a team that you need to be developing early on when you're looking at, at moving a program online. And that team uh, looks at all the other administrative services you need to deal with, your um, Office of Information Technology, you have to be having discussions with the admissions, with the registrar, with the bursar. A huge key player early on is your marketing. And that's all done in conjunction with the faculty group that is moving this along. So I think that you know part of what you want to look at when you're taking the program online is who's going to be part of that planning. So the first step that we do here is we have we have the groups come in and we sit down and we say, okay, do you have a market for this idea? So we do a lot of market research, um, needs analysis, sustainability reports. Um, we can do some things internally, but a lot of times we use some of our external vendors who are, are able to do some of this analysis and reports for us and bring that in and sit down to have a good discussion. So what you're looking at really is you know, where is your institution at? Are you at a point where you can do a lot of internal support or do you want to work with vendor partners? And we really have a three-way process here at Ohio. One of the things that we've done in the last couple of years, I've been with Ohio for uh, a little over two years now, is that we had a program that was working with a grant that you can get here at the University of Conacher grant. And over a two-year process, we have developed the whole process for, you know, as an institution on how to move a program online. And out of that, we have three options. You know, they will come to eLearning Ohio to do that market uh, research and, you know, and see whether it's going to be a viable program. But beyond that, you have the option of you can work with a vendor partner or you can use some vendor tools on what you do. You can work totally with the support of eLearning Ohio or within your college, you can run a program yourself. So at this point, I think that I'm going to be addressing some more of the detail in this as we move along. Um, so, you know, keep in mind thinking about your institution when I come up to this. Are you a strong um, centralized or decentralized institution? And when we get into the next section, we'll be discussing that a little bit more. At this time, we'll turn it over. Yeah, thank you. This is Karen Kennedy from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Uh, I work within the College of the School of Business here at UAB. So my, as, as Dev had pointed out, my perspective is a little bit more in the trenches in, in trying to forward a program at the school level. The university is is a public urban university. We have a very strong medical focus here at the university and access to education is, is part of our mission. As a major academic medical center, much of the focus of our marketing of the university and, and the I mean, things that are going on are very healthcare related. 
And as a school of business, sometimes we, we have a role to play there, but we're not in, we haven't in the past been in the central mix of, of the health movement here on campus. But a little bit more about us to understand the context. We're an unusual institution in that we have more employees than we have students. And people often find that very surprising. But much of it is is that we run this major medical center with a hospital that uh, requires so many employees. Like Deb described, we're also a very, and I would say fairly, a decentralized operating structure here where schools is they have their strategic missions can if, if they can fund it if they can put together a business plan for how something can be successful then we have a a, a nice amount of latitude to make that happen. One of the things that happened about four years ago is that the university established some some aggressive growth goals. At the time, and it was about 2011, it was a 50 percent growth of student headcount by 2020. Well, <clears throat> for a university that's heavily research and um, focused in, a, in kind of a different area for the what's called in our uh, at our university the academic side, the non-medical side of campus. This was a, a very aggressive growth goal for us. But within the Collapse School of Business, we had some advantages in that our location is is very much a an advantage for a business school. Where it's a regional center of business here, so we have wonderful relationships with our local community business leaders and so forth. We also had a history, and this was important as we started to look for areas of growth, of serving non-traditional as well as traditional students. As an urban campus, and those of you who are on urban campuses, you probably see some of the same profile of students as this mix of traditional and non-traditional students. So this, this helped us as we started thinking about the growth goals that the university was really pushing us toward. With the highest levels of accreditation, we're SACS accredited, we're AACSB accredited, both for the school and the accounting programs. And whatever strategy that we decided to go forward with, we all agreed, we being our faculty, our administration, all agreed that our accreditation and quality standards would be maintained. So you know, these, some of these are, are forming the basis of a, the strategy that we developed. We have about currently about 2,700 students, 65 full-time faculty, that is within the school, Collapse School of Business, of course. Now as we look at a little bit more about us, the environment in which we received this growth directive and, and decided to take on this challenge was that prior to 2009, we'd had some steady decreases of student count and credit hours over the last six years. So when somebody came, that our, our dean came from meetings and first said, OK, we're, we're now looking at how do we grow our programs 50% in the next eight, nine years. When you looked at where we had been, that was, it was not a pretty picture. And um, so, you know, we had to certainly take that into account. We knew we weren't going to grow doing the same things that we had all had been doing. Just to give you a little preview, over the last three years, from fall 11 to fall 13, we've, we've had an increase of 33% in student count. Since we put this um, strategy in place, and 20% and in credit hour growth. So you know that, that was good. Back in 11, we set a, a growth goal of taking us from 2,000 to 3,000 students by 2020. Well, uh, as you might imagine, as we started to have some success, our goal moved. So now we, we're at looking at a goal of 5,000 students by 2020. And that is certainly going to be a stretch goal for us. We're, as I mentioned previously, we're 
currently at 2,700 students. We've made progress, but 5,000 is, is still growth. But all of this to say that some of the successes that we've had and our plans for the future require much in the way of strategic planning. This, when you're in a position where you've had, you had had declining enrollments, to turn that around and to reach some stretch goals, we really had to focus and have had to focus on the strategic planning process and, and decide how we're going to do this. And for us in education, this is, this is somewhat of a new problem. It's a classic problem for businesses of how do you grow your business? How, do you, how can you grow when your current market conditions aren't such that, that you know, they're as favorable as you would like? We had to look at, you know, beyond our traditional markets, we had to look at a, a different competitive set than we have had in the past. Certainly, we had other competition with huge, huge marketing outreach. And that's in the form of some of the not only for-profit institutions that we all are looking at, but also in some of our local market, the conditions were such that I, I don't know how many of you are familiar or follow SEC football, but here in the state of Alabama, SEC football is, is a tremendous force and a tremendous marketing outreach force because as our you know, in-state football teams were gaining national notoriety, then the marketing efforts, the marketing value of that has been tremendous. UAB does not have that advantage, so we had to look at some other advantages. We certainly, like probably many other state schools, had to start thinking about market-based programs because the state funding was not going to increase. And as we're all facing, we had to look at new expectations and needs of students, students coming to us not as prepared as we might like. Something that's absolutely essential, and Deb mentioned this, so to, as, as did Michelle, thinking about the competitive advantage. I think as we looked back and did some dissecting of why our numbers had been declining is that we were like some other business schools. We had a solid program and, and the world had been good to us. The students had been good to us. And we really had never defined what a competitive advantage was as we saw increasing competition. So one of the first things that we did, and, and I think this is, is just foundational, very fundamental, is that why is, is asking yourself the question, why will students drive past, pick a number, three other business schools or three other nursing schools or whatever your market is to come to your school? and be able to articulate that and articulate it not only externally but internally with faculty, with staff, with our university. This was something that we spent some time really developing a narrative about our competitive advantage and how we were going to be able to grow in a market that was not favorable to us. One of the things that we also did was look at how do we share the risk because supporting growth when your funding you know, is decreasing from states, uh, our funding was, was decreasing from our tuition dollars coming in. So as we looked at the growth strategy, we had to look at how do we share the risk and, uh, in order to support the growth plan that we had. So we'll, we'll go back to Deb and what we've each tried to do is set the context. So now we'll get into some of the Thank you, Karen. Um, as I said, you know, I'm kind of doing the institutional overview. And so, you know, the things you need to do to influence the change in your institution to help accept online programs, you need to like, you know, the key question is, 
why do you want to take a program online? And, and the key things that I have always seen is that you know it, it could be driven from um, a, a discipline or faculty saying there is a perceived market. Um, revenue generation is usually more of a top-down approach to looking at this. Um, and then there's also the service to students, which within our regional um, higher education, they had looked at that very seriously because, um, it, you know, I think it was an Edge of Ventures report, but there was a report I had read that said that, you know, the majority of your students will be within 50 miles of your campus or campuses. But, you know, their lifestyle drives the fact that they can't always come into the classroom at the time the classes are offered. So, you know, it's really a good combination of this. If you pick out, and I'll, I'll pick on revenue generation, if you pick out that, and because I've seen a number of programs in my years that have not have failed because they're looking at just growing the revenue without the other considerations when it's, you know, when it's really sometimes a top-down push um, that the faculty haven't had much of a say or a buy-in to, to this and that they're really looking for revenue generation and they try to stand up programs too quickly, then you often have um, you know, a, a, a horrible experience and not very successful for your students who ultimately are who you want to serve. So some of the things that you've got to look at from a more institutional approach is looking at within your regional accreditation um, and are you, have you gotten the state authorizations to move the programs you'd like to move into, the, into those states and have you carefully looked if you're going to be doing programs that are going to have internships, practicums, um, there, there's a lot of different states have different regulations on this. Plus, there's also a lot of federal regulations now, you know, um, for, you know, for many reasons. Online learning is very much under the microscope and where you need to look. So these are some of the very top things that, as an institution, you have to look at. Um, the next slide I'm going to be talking a little bit about is then when you're really getting down to the nitty gritty, so you have seen a market analysis, the faculty in this discipline want to take this accounting degree or whatever degree it is, take it online, then you know who needs to be in the planning team and do there need to be more than one planning team? And I would definitely say yes. One of the things that you know we found is that there are, every institution has its process about how they get curriculum through the, the you know, college curriculum, the institutional curriculum, then you know, here at Ohio, then it goes on to a program needs to be approved by the Board of Trustees, and then finally by the Board of Regents. And sometimes, depending on whether it's a new program or not, we also have to, we're, uh, we're um, a higher learning commission here in Ohio, so you, know, you have to take that in consideration. So you have to go through all the team that needs to do all that. But then there are, is the team that really is going to look at the logistics a little bit. And so then um, who are the key, key players that have to be um, in place to make sure that you've got the right codes, that you have an application, that you're doing the marketing, and then also are you getting your courses designed? So, you know, a key thing to look at is a timeline to launch a program. And as I had mentioned earlier, that we had worked on a two-year process with this program that was going online. And this is not something that when you want to do it well and make sure that it works, um, that you can't really rush into. I know there's the problems of, okay, we may lose the market if we take too long. But when you're working in a very decentralized and large institution, then there's the process you have to go through, and you have to kind of work those out. But you need to develop a timeline for your launch of your program and kind of work back. And I would highly recommend even using some kind of project management software. I mean, that's part of what eLearning Ohio is helping um, programs go now, is looking at that timeline, working through the process. And we have this process, and the next slide will talk about a couple of steps to that. But, you know, it took us a while to get that in place. And then do you have the right support and services in place? So you have to, you know, look at an infrastructure. Um, uh, a previous um, leadership had decided about six, seven years ago here at Ohio that they really wanted to move into the online market. And that's why we do have a number of programs that work with the vendor prop. Um, we work with vendor partners because we didn't really have all the infrastructure in places. We had bits and pieces. We had programs out of different colleges. 
we had not really pulled together a strong infrastructure and um, services. And that's what we've been doing for the last couple of years of really building that infrastructure. Because you need to have the technical infrastructure. You need to make sure you have all the, you know, when it comes to regional accreditation, are you offering the same services that you offer your campus students to your online students? Because when you come for re regional accreditation, they're going to look for those things. Um, how are you handling advising? Are you doing um, student success? It's, you know, it, it's very similar to what you do for your first year retention, but are you, do you have in place the tools um, and the people that will help students move into being um, successful online students? So, I've, you know, there's a lot of things here that you have to take a look at in the overarching picture. And when we did work with our planning process that we've been putting together, um, this is just a, a condensment of some of the steps that we've looked at. But, you know, it starts out with that idea generation and feasibility review. And that we are clearly in this process we developed. We are clearly looking first at is there really a market, do, you know, what kind of services or, or students are you going to service with that? And that's a step that as you're getting to the point to saying, yes, we think there's a market, that you really start bringing in the marketing folks to start looking at as we, you know, you run some of these processes side by side. And so how are, you know, who were those students we are going to market to then? Did the market analysis? Just give us ideas on that, or um, do we need to go back and work with, like in our case, our community college partners to help do the marketing there? So you've got to move some of these um, steps along. So, and then I did mention briefly the program um, proposal development and getting that all through the approvals that you have to at your institution, and that can be a very time-consuming process. And when you get all those approval processes in place, are you have to be side by side with those steps, developing the plan of action to get um, the course development done, the marketing, making sure the infrastructure and technology is in place. Um, and so these are processes that you know can take up to two years to be realistic with this. You know, the this one program we, we were just kicked off this fall was a two year planning process through through the university system here and then um, have that launch plan in place. And now we have some um, more detailed steps into that, but that kind of gives you a quick step through of the timeline of what you might need to do. So as I turn this back over to Karen, she's going to talk a little bit more about you know the faculty and what happens in the trenches there. So Karen? Thank you. I absolutely agree. The issue of the timeline and the making sure that you've aligned all of the pieces and parts that have to be aligned is absolutely essential. And that was one thing that was a surprise to me coming uh, from this at the school level, that the, 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 all the moving parts of trying to take, take this sort of, take in our case where we decided to go was with growth toward online programs. So, we spent a, a considerable amount of time to look at program level concerns, what were the individual and collective concerns of faculty, how to get their buy-in, and just to give you a, a little sense of where we started, and it took us, a, I agree, it was, took us about two years from the beginning of the conversation till we were live with classes to take our accounting program online. We decided to start with probably one of the most difficult programs because of some of the external factors with, with accounting and, and the opportunities there. But having many conversations with faculty, helping faculty understand why we were doing these things, having the buy-in of faculty was was essential. One of the, the difficulties when I've seen things at the school level work that have been mandated or you know faculty feel like come from the top, it's often because there's a black box that you don't really know what's going on or why people are asking us to do what they're asking us to do. Well, what we did and tried to provide every bit of data 
that we were looking at in thinking about the, the market opportunities, what it would take, the investments, and so forth, and, and had um, shared everything that we were looking at, had multiple meetings, you know, asking faculty to look at data, look at the, the look at pro formas, and things like that. So the, the getting that buy-in and, and providing this level of support, before we took programs online, we had courses online. And we started out without a, without a plan, really, years ago. It, it, was, it happened because certain, certain very technologically advanced faculty wanted to take their class online or felt that it would be a good uh, way to extend their reach for online, and as we got into it, and as you moved past the early adopters within our faculty group, one of the things that we heard from faculty that they were absolutely right and we acted on was the fact that we needed support within our school, somebody who understood our programs from an instructional design standpoint, somebody that could take subject matter, could work with subject matter experts of the faculty and help develop online classes because that's not something that you know, many faculty have been dealing with for, for very long. So the, as, as we try to find out of how to get the faculty buy-in, the, the, the Opening up the black box was one of the most important things that I think that uh, we did. There are challenges. Of course there are challenges. So you guys all know that. We had, it, we had to think about different markets. We do have, even now with our online programs, the, uh, many of them are still relatively local within the state, many of our students are within the state, but we are at a, you know, marketing at a national level. We outsourced with a partner. Pearson was the, um, the company that we are working with who is a, you know, it was a different model for us, a different model for our school to have a partner. And this is something that is whatever direction, marketing direction that you may be going, something to, to consider because that was a new experience for, for our faculty. It, you know, we spent the first year, it, and I, we had this conversation multiple times, that these are not the, at the time we got started it was Embanet. It's not Embanet students. These are UAB students. This is our partner. They're just not a um, vendor that we happen to be working with. That they are. Their success is tied to our success. So this was a one of the challenges that we faced, and is an ongoing conversation that we have with faculty as we have new faculty coming in who are, this is a different model for them. But this is something that has also taken some time. We, we certainly invested the resources, mentioned about instructional design, but multimedia, many other things like that were some of the things that we have and still are investing in, always always an issue, finding the right level of technology for high touch that our faculty will use and will serve our students. Another thing, and Deb touched on this, so I won't uh, go into it, but the central support for the process type changes that needed to be made. <clears throat> At our school, we typically don't deal with undergraduate admissions. We have a central office, but for our online programs, we're much more involved in that. And we had to make sure that we understood the systems and how this different kind of program would feed into that. The shared vision is something that, and I probably should have put this as a first point, helping our our faculty and our staff develop this shared vision. Deb talked about some of the things that happen at the university levels and through senior leadership of the university, but it was very important as we tried to shift our perspectives 
is to have frontline leadership, our department chairs, who were understanding why we were doing what we're doing and can continue to share those thoughts with both faculty, with our support staff, with our partners, if you will, across campus, and, and I, that's how I view them also. We have Pearson as a partner, but we have our, have our partners who are all having to work together to help us deliver this program. But sharing that vision of why we're doing what we're doing and, and continuing to explain, even four years into this, we're still talking about vision. What is it we're trying to accomplish? Because there certainly there continues to be turn, turnover among both faculty and staff and central personnel and so forth. Something else that, in, in any time you look at organizational change, you certainly see the role of ongoing communications, and, and we probably all have, have read much of the literature on change. But something that I think is, is something to absolutely keep in mind, and, and I say this after four years of, of working with our programs trying to help help our faculty, our staff understand is this notion of listening and listening to their questions. I had a wonderful lesson taught to me just last week from our Director of Career Services in which she was expressing some frustration and, and asking some questions about how we were going to be able to serve our online students. And, and she, taught me, she taught me a very good lesson because I knew that she is fully committed to helping our students, but she really wasn't understanding how our local office, our, and we have an office within our school for career services, and how it was going to fit together. And at first, I thought, you know, oh, I was a little impatient. And I said, okay, well, yeah, you know, you know, we've been working on this program. But then I stepped back and listened, and and I was struck by some honest questions are a good way to to help understand what some of the issues remain on the table. And people are, at most of, you know, our folks are wanting, this, wanting our efforts to succeed. We've had some early successes. But we still have questions and being patient and still listening to those questions and helping people understand why we're doing what we're doing is something that I, I'm not sure ever goes away. But it's something as we think about change and growing programs that uh, is, is, continues to be top of mind for me anyway. We, I've, I've talked about the faculty a bit. Absolutely, we're not going to deliver high quality programs without our faculty and with our faculty being on board and it goes back to the understanding of the why, the realities of our need for growth. And we have explained our business model and, and what our future looks like with and without our online programs and we continue to have to do that, con continually helping people, faculty, understand. Now, as we thought about faculty deployment getting started with this, two things that we did is that four years ago we told faculty who were sitting in the room that if they did not want to teach online, if they did not want to participate in an online program, they did not have to do that. We were not going to twist arms. We had plenty of work for faculty. Full, we could fill their teaching loads without teaching online if they did not want to. We also um, said that as we hire new people, you know, we have certainly talked to them about the role of online programs, online teaching to our growth, and, and as people have made the choices to, to come to UAB, come to the Collapse School of Business, they know that online programs are a part of our future. Another decision that we made on the deployment issue is that our faculty would be teaching on load. So, um, it was something that made it a little bit easier, I think, to get some faculty buy-in because it showed how important this was to our core business. So as we think about faculty, and you all are probably all facing some of these same issues, what do, what do you think faculty see as the most pressing challenge facing delivery online programs? And so we've got a poll here, and 
I've got some answers up here. Maintaining quality of the programs, achieve, achieving learning objectives, engaging students, managing class sizes, or needing support. So as you think about your faculty, could you take a moment and go to the, the little box on the left-hand side with A and put in your answer of what you see is what you think faculty see is the most pressing challenge facing online program delivery. I'll give you just a minute to be able to respond. I think we'll have answers coming up just shortly. Okay. So kind of tied between A and E for what your responses are. So we will, let me move on and, and just say quickly, this is kind of a trick question because it's really all of the above. We had, we had our faculty expressing some of, you know, all of these issues and, and all of these issues are very legitimate. How do you engage students? We're used to working with students in a face-to-face -face environment, but how do you engage them if you can't see them, if you can't sit down and have a conversation with them? The managing class sizes and workload is, is we are growing, and I think with many growing pains, it's, this is a front and center issue that we are dealing with. Faculty needing support, are they going to get the support they need to manage the workload? So as, as we have worked through some of these, these issues with faculty, we certainly see that all of the above is the correct answer. So I, if this were really a test question, then I probably would have not gotten good teaching avowals because uh, it was all the above and I really didn't give you that as an opportunity for a response. We have had some faculty wins and I think this is exciting to share because while we certainly continue to have some challenges, but we've had faculty recognize the benefits of, of online programs. They, we have our faculty work with an instructional designer to develop an online class. And for many faculty, I know it was for me, it was the first time that I had really sat down with somebody whose area of expertise was instructional design to help me design a course. So that planning and thinking process of what is it I'm really trying to achieve, how do I make sure that the course is designed not as a to replicate what we do face to face, but plan in working with an instructional designer. We've had faculty extend their online work to face to face teaching and see that as a big win. Flexibility of schedule is an important win for some of our faculty as are as is reducing the preps that they have. So some challenges. But, but quite a few faculty wins here. So going okay, thank back you, to Karen. Karen. As I see, we're starting to move to the top of the hour. I'll move through my last slide here pretty quickly. But in any process that you do, you know, um, you assessment is an ongoing process, and that you really need to work with your internal and external constituents. And if you look at the little diagram there talks about things I've talked about. You know, you had that program pro um, proposal, the approvals and uh, getting it developed, and that launch plan with, uh, with all of the right constituents, its table, and moving along. So then you're delivering your program. And, you know, one of the things that uh, works in hand in hand with um, good assessment of program delivery is quality matters. And uh, I, we use quality matters here as an internal um, quality assurance process to reviewing the courses. We've just been kicking that off. Like I said, you know, I've already been with Ohio for a couple of years, but some of these things are now just getting put into place. So we use Quality Matters. We've had some of our courses go for national review and do very well. So we're in that process of making sure that all that we have been doing for the last eight to ten years are now getting reviewed and in, uh, we have good course quality for the programs. And then <clears throat> this part of the assessment and revision process 
Excuse me. We're also um, going to be using the Online Learning Consortium's Quality Scorecard. I have been working with that at previous institutions too. It's a very good tool and I highly recommend it. Because what did you can do with the Quality Scorecard? <coughs> Excuse me. Is that it? Also looks at um, different levels. It looks at you know what you can do for the academic program and are the faculty getting what they need and the follow through on this. It is a, a review of the online distance and online program offerings at the program level and also addresses institutional support. So I would say that you know we always do in any kind of process follow out with um, assessment and revision and how you can make your process better. And with that, I'll turn it over to Karen. Absolutely. One thing that I would add, and we're using some of those the same assessments because quality of what we're delivering is the essence of what we're trying to accomplish, is an interactivity rubric. And I have on the citation on the slide here in which what we're really trying to get to and an important piece for our faculty was how are we engaging the students and there is that rubric there we use an, an adapted version and find it very helpful. The student engagement piece is one that, that continues to uh, be a, a challenge for us. It's certainly a key variable because the making sure the students are engaged and continuing is is essential. Helping students see their vision for success, for completing the course successfully, for completing the program successfully, what's beyond the particular course or program has been essential. Our career services office is we're at the point now where we have students who are seeing that as a an office a help that can help them see the vision that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. So I'm, I'm going to move quickly here. We have had some, some student wins. In addition to faculty wins, we have had some student wins. And it's, it's been interesting to see how our students interact with one another. And the social media has been an important piece of this. They help one another, not unlike, very, as, as I said in the previous slide, similar to what some of our uh, local students do, our face-to-face -face students, I'm, I'm sorry, our online students are using the same, same tools to communicate with one another. And moving on to where challenges and opportunities remain, the in helping engage the online students with employers in similar fashion to what is we do face to face is an important piece and one that we are still working on. The alumni relationships are something that we are looking ahead to having increasing alums for our program and how do we engage them in the um, in the online environment and to make get them tightly connected. Although I know we have a group planning to come for graduation in December, so things like that are some of the real wins and, and opportunities to extend. I'm going to move on and go back to Michelle and, and she's got some uh, closing rubric to share with you. Thanks so much. Karen and Deb, very interesting to hear about all the successes that you're having in your programs. So in order really we feel to be successful for the next phase of online program growth, this importance of being market driven in the selection of programs that, um, that you want to take online um, is, is really critical. Um, and higher enrollments in online education are going to be won by institutions that have the tools and best practices that they need to create the online adult learner focus in degree programs that will deliver the experience and the outcomes that these students want. And this also needs to be coupled with very strong investment in creating an intentional positive experience for students to win recommendations, in uh, having a strong and comprehensive marketing plan, and making strong investment in the people and technology needed to drive higher enrollments in the highly competitive market of today. Institutions that simply replicate their on-ground program online are simply not going to be able to survive in the current market uh, conditions. 
So with that, I think we need to uh, end the session and turn it back over to our moderator. So for some concluding remarks, I'll turn to Brennan Delaney from Pearson. Thank you, Kristen. And thanks to Deb, Karen, and Michelle for a wonderful presentation. As we wrap up, we have a few final items to cover with you all. Firstly, if you'd like to learn more about how Pearson can help your institution expand the reach of your degree programs through online learning, visit pearsonambinet.com forward slash services. This link and those I'll mention next are all available to you in the chat window right now on the bottom left of your screen. For more information regarding the Pearson webinar program, please visit pearsonlearningsolutions.com forward slash webinars, where you can register for Pearson's upcoming presentations and access a library of recordings of past popular events. We also invite you to engage with us on social media. Be sure to follow us on Twitter via at Pearson North AM and subscribe to our teaching and learning blog for thought-provoking articles, videos, and podcasts around the latest trends in online and blended learning. Last but not least, as you log out, please take 30 seconds to fill out a brief survey through which you can provide feedback on the quality of today's presentation. Your input plays a critical role in guiding improvements on future events and is extremely valuable to us. The link to that survey, again, is available right now in the chat window. Thanks again to our presenters for a great presentation today and to the Online Learning Consortium for helping put all this together. Goodbye, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you, Brennan. On behalf of the Online Learning Consortium, I'd like to thank you all for attending, and thank you to our presenters as well as Pearson. The recording will be made available.